So we've asked a few people here who have dedicated a great deal of their time thinking about how to promote well-being in the workplace and you know for all different reasons. To my left is uh, Catherine Bell. She's an author and a founder of uh, The Awakened Company, the book's premise is that work isn't separate from life. She knows about what promotes and detracts from well-being, both as an employee, yes, and as a founder of a, a company called Blue Era. It's an executive search team transformation and coaching company, and it was recognized as one of Canada's fastest growing companies and one of Alberta's best workplaces. So she thought a lot about how to make it a best workplace. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Joel Solomon is a chairman. He's uh, actually uh, uh, just a new uh, director at UBC, I hear. So there you go. That's the connection to President um, uh, Ono. Chairman of the Renewal Funds, that's Canada's largest social venture capital fund, number one. Board of Directors of um, the Learning Centre, Hollyhock. How many of you know Hollyhock? So this is a place that you go to learn and to feel well. And this was an idea of Joel's and, and friends many, many years ago, committed to creating lifelong learning and leadership curriculum. He's also the author of The Clean Money Revolution. That's a pretty new book, Reinventing, this, I love the subtitle, not, not, not just a little job, Reinventing Power, Purpose, and Capitalism. <laughs> I love your website. It says you're an advisor, a convener, and a citizen. Right, welcome. And Gail Markin is from the Langley School District, which is the school district that we're in right now. And, and Gail's part of a, um, a large, or small, I should say, but very powerful leadership team that's engaging the whole school district and ed all the educators and staff in an effort to focus more on their own well-being. This is a fairly new thing in school districts. Would you say people who are working in school districts should really focus on your own well-being in an organized way as, a fo as opposed to focusing entirely on the students' uh, well-being? So this is a multi-year process and we've just finished the first year of that and that's the idea is to shift the culture, right, mm -hmm. to uh, more well-being. Uh, adult well-being, uh, and I said it's the first, the first year of that. So here we have some people who might have some wisdom to share about how do you create a, a workplace, how do you have a workplace that's more likely to promote well-being? Welcome. So I wonder if we could start with the question of um, maybe if you just put yourself in the picture, what does it feel like to you when you're in a workplace where that promotes well-being? So for me, when I think of well-being in the workplace, I think of uh, a line. There's an asleep line and an awake line. And I, if I can just use an example from today. So the asleep me is going, oh my goodness, there's so many people in that room. They're teachers. My mom was a teacher. My sister was a teacher. I revere teachers. And I'm not good enough. And I'm not good enough. So there's this asleep line where we can catch ourselves in the act of being asleep. That's not my well place. My well place is knowing that everybody belongs, mm -hmm. including me, in, in the picture. So if we can begin to think, um, are we coming from that awake place or a sleep place in terms of our well-being? And then if you picture concentric circles, so we begin with the self, this awake asleep line. Then we think of our relationships. And this is one-on-one -on -one relationships. Within the workplace. Within the workplace. And then we think of our teams, our organizations, and communities. Are we coming from that awake place or that more asleep place? And context mm -hmm. deeply, deeply matters in well-being. And so your, your hope is that all workplaces promote that feeling of being awake and present and feeling like you're enough. And you, you're enough, you belong. Yes. And we're also here to create something more together. Okay. There's a deeper purpose as to why the organization mm -hmm exists. Mm -hmm. So it calls upon our sense of meaning, our sense of depth, our sense of being real mm -hmm. with each other. Yeah, that's pretty amazing that, to think that it, that's a lot. That's a mm -hmm. lot to, to expect, but we're going to get back to that. Are there such a, is there such a company? Yes, yes. Joel, just around that question of for you, what does it feel like when you're in a, a workplace, especially where you're, where you're well? So I made a choice early in life after facing the things I faced in, in younger years that because of the privilege and circumstance that I was born into with a family of entrepreneurs that made money from being immigrants, recent immigrant uh, descendants, and uh, used, I'm from Tennessee, if I 
someone else earlier, so uh, my accent may sound different. I'm from Tennessee. I've been living in Vancouver and Canada for now more than half my life, I'm proud to say. But in any case, I made the choice to take on the idea that money, business, and finance needed a lot of reform and that it could be a super important force for good in the world. Now, when I say, when we hear uh, venture capital, I, how many people have a great impression of what that career is? <laughs> so then money, how does the word money feel? <laughs> and thing. what does that agitate and, and, and raise about us? Well, I maintain that we are connected to our money, where it came from, what it is doing to people and places, how it affects us, how it affects our families, how it affects our psychology, our emotional being, et cetera, and our whole society. That area needs a lot of uh, uh, care workers. So next is, it's imperfect. Uh, our workplace is definitely imperfect. Mm -hmm. We work in one of the most toughest, uh, what we think is a really tough arena to be in as venture capital. And how do we bring kinder, gentler, more conscious, more intentional work into that kind of workplace? So I would, the, the simple form is, I spend my time as the elder there and the uh, senior uh, partner in it, thinking about what have I learned and about workplaces and about people, and how can we look at the psychological, the emotional, and the spiritual, as well as physical, and good jobs and feel good about your career. And consider where, where are the uh, things that can be done to create better openness, sharing, mm -hmm. caring, supporting of each other, self-esteem, and how to walk around the world in a, in a, in, and be proud and understand that you're about something. The very first principle is our firm is designed to be about changing the world for the better. That's unique in most finance still. That will change. It is changing over these years. But the meaning and purpose of it is the core of wellness for us in this business and for our team. Because uh, we actually shifted from social venture capital to mission venture capital. And so for us, it's mission first. We invest in organic food, skin care, and environmental technologies. We believe that those inherently are doing things to improve the world. And so first we get to work in arenas that people actually feel pretty good about. The so you're saying that by, just by virtue of the work you're doing, it makes meaningful to those people who are working there, that will contribute to their well-being. That is the starting place, that they can walk around and not feel ashamed, not feel that people are... And so our reputation, our integrity, how we treat the companies that we get involved with, how we treat when the exit happens, when the company's being sold or we're getting out in some way. There's so many ways that uh, finance and business works that are fairly brutal and harsh. It's a competitive game. And so how do you work in that field and soften all those things and stay in tune with what really matters and why we're in the business? Well, I would argue that there are a lot of organizations that are about doing good, that still there are things happening within those organizations that everybody who's working Absolutely. there can't get behind. That's right. So there's a theme here that it's not just about uh, dealing with money and the bad word money, but if you work for an organization that you feel there are some things that are happening there that are hurtful to people. Yes. That can't be due, that can, this is probably transferable then, you're thinking. That's right. So next do come those personal skills and how do we support each person to be their best, the best that we can. And I said, how do we treat people, treat each other? And then the various techniques that one might think of, of how you'd make a better workplace. Organizational development, consulting, and opportunity to talk to a coach. Some of our us more senior ones in the firm being uh, able to talk with younger ones about the actual challenges they're happening, steer them towards resources where they could actually get help. Uh, but, but I think I'll just, I'll just say, so we do all of those things, and again, it's not perfect, and any workplace I've ever been exposed to, the companies that we support, how do we, supp how do we help them have a better workplace? Mm -hmm. They're under unbelievable pressure. One more thing I'll mention is we have over 200 investors around the continent and some globally, and they're mostly individuals. And we, th that means we're under a different kind of performance metric 
than a lot of the finance world is. We have people that also care about things. And so that shifts. We still want to make the best return rate that we can for those investors. But there are a number of things, if you are in a business, that you can structure around different values, different outcomes than what is assumed about the industry, and you can still do well. Do well financially, mm -hmm. do well as a company. So I, I don't want to take too much time. No, no, I'm just thinking about something I read that, that, you, that you wrote that said, I want to be a billionaire of love, right? That's a different, I can't even get my head around that when I think about, I don't even know what venture capital is, but any, if I did, I bet you I wouldn't be able to get my head around that idea of love and venture capital. So we're going to come back to that. I'm going to ask you to, to break that down even more, because what I'm trying to do at the same time is understand how the work that you do and the work you do can, can also relate if you're in education or if you're in social services or whatever work you do. There's something about what you're saying that, that crosses those boundaries. And um, so, Gail, for you, the question was, what is it like for you when you're in a workplace where uh, you feel well, where it's well-being that's being? Yeah, well, first I'll connect with, with uh, Joel's point. He said, we're, we're in the business to make the world a better place. So I really think there is a big connection there, because that's what we're out mm -hmm. to do as well. Um, but what is it if you're in a place that you feel well? It's very similar. Um, to what we're trying to do in our schools in the classroom, mm. right? It's a place that you feel that you belong, that you have something to contribute to that, um, that the group is better off that you're there, and you're better off because the group is surrounding you. Mm -hmm. um, it's a place that you want to go to in the morning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not always perfect. You're not always going to, you know, this is my happy place or anything like that. It doesn't have to be. But I like what Catherine says is this is your life. Like this isn't just some place that you go and you, um, you go and you gather your paycheck and, and then you go home. Like this is actually a lot of your life. So it has to be a place where you feel inspired and creative and safe and yeah, happy. So um, I'm wondering how we're doing. Catherine, you've been surveying, talking to people from all kinds of organizations and um, asking the question, how are you doing? So I would like to give some research. Um, from Gallup, 70% of people are disengaged at work. 70%? 70%. And 18% of those are actively working against the organization that they're working with. 70%. So that means we're losing humanity. Wow. Like, we are losing humanity, and then it gets worse. So you know how I talk about the circles with the individual relationship and company? Okay, what is worse than taking out the kitty litter? What is worse than taking out the trash? Spending time with your boss is rated lower. The lowest. Why? By Rath, and the essential, it's from his book, The Essential Elements. So, you What's know, and, and how, how tragic for the, um, the boss hole and how tragic for the person being led. <laughs> you know, it's just beyond, it's beyond, it's so devastating. Okay, so and then first I have of all, worse data, oh, okay, worse okay, data, go ahead, go ahead. worse data. So then, then we have, so we have the person, right? And then we have don't, the- Don't hit your mic, because okay, every time sorry. you hit your mic, it yeah, gives okay. Michael a heart attack back there. Sorry, Michael. <laughs> um, then we have the relationship. And then, so we look at the organizational context, and 75, uh, no, uh, over 75% of businesses don't survive past nine years. So in other words, the system is broken, and there's an opportunity for us to all awaken. You think? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just glad I work for myself, and I like my boss. <laughs> All right, let's go back to that boss business. What the heck? I know. What is going on there? Anybody? Joel, what's your face saying? Why? What's going on? What are the reasons people don't like their boss? Or, to, or I shouldn't uh, say that, don't want to spend time with their boss. Well, let's start with uh, how we all got here on this continent, most of us that are in the room and a colonial system that was built on how do you systematically mm. extract and make profit, uh, how do you exploit people to do that with, and 
And so I, I could go further on uh, even, uh, ent is it entomology about words, etymology, which are, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Bugs, not bugs, but words. The, but the language, the language itself and, and the implied structural gender issues and all oppressive uh, language and, th and things like that. So the concept of boss, the central power mm. that controls everything, has inherently got some challenges. Meanwhile, we still need to run all kinds of systems and make things happen, and the buses run on time, and the conference ends, and, and the food come strike. out, and the you know school strikes, all, all of that. So I think it's a it's it's a little bit biased against that person. There are many advantages to being in charge, but it's a tough role, and the models are not very good, and they need a lot of reinvention. So that would be. I'll, there's a little bite for you. I, what I'm wondering about is um, what kinds of things, what is an awakened boss? Because among, among those, and actually the word boss is probably not even, it's probably leader, boss. I mean, boss is a great word, but if it's an organization, it's a leader. What is an awakened? Um, first of all, Gail, I'll ask you, I mean, that, does it, how important are leaders, from your perspective, a, systemic, a systems perspective, because you're trying now to shift a culture? Yeah, well, they're huge, um, for sure. Um, and it, it is important that, um, that they're able to see and, and are able to, to enter the conversation. So it is huge. Whoever is the, the leader in your organization has to be part of a change like this, or it won't work. Um, but it also has to be throughout the whole system. Yeah. Like it has to involve everyone because if it is only the leaders, it's not gonna work either. So it's hugely important, but it's also just as important to have everyone involved. Yeah. Yeah. And so let's just talk for a minute about what an awakened leader is and just let's just for the people here who are in any kind of leadership capacity because it's not just in the corporate world as there's one CEO. In this room, there are a lot of people who have leadership over over different groups and organizations. So let's just for a moment try to have some pearls of wisdom about what is an awakened leader, how do we, how do we become an awakened leader? So Maria, an awakened leader is awakening, i.e. that is they're continually learning and growing. They also recognize that everybody's a leader. And leadership, leadership casts both dark, light, and gray shadow. So everywhere you go as a leader, it's like there is a camera on you. And one of the tidbits I've taken away from one of my mentors, Julian Barling, um, from Queen's University, is there's four eyes associated with a true, true leader. And leadership has nothing to do with I. It's about idealized influence, living the values, intellectual stimulation. Are we, are we kind of questioning people? Um, it's about... Um, um, uh, intellectual stimulation, idealized influence, individualized consideration, i.e. we're not treating every student in the classroom. I have two boys, um, 12 and 14, and I don't want them to be treated the same as everybody. I want them to be considered. So are we, are we considering them as, as individuals? That's what um, awakening leaders do. And as well, they also hold a vision for the future and embody that vision now. So I'm thinking about the kinds of things that we're doing here today at, in, in this taking care of yourself. And sometimes we're looking at our inner world and the, our, our emotions and what's driving us and what's scaring us. And sometimes that kind of exploration is not can, OK within the world of work, because it's like too, it takes too much time. It's not appropriate. Uh, Joel, your, your life's experience is different. I think you have an idea that that leader has to do that kind of work that we're doing here today. Lifelong learning. Uh, and by lifelong learning, I don't just mean technical and practical skills. I mean inner skills, well-being, love. How do I continually learn what's going on inside myself, address it, do the things I need to? So. There's a long list of, of, of ways to do those practices, and I don't think there's any correct practice. There are many correct practices. But if there, the key is that there's a commitment to keep growing internally along with the things that are more commonly supported in us. And so I think that if we are, and I would say this is an important part of the workplace for me, it is my job to model and be as weird and eccentric as necessary 
as together and clear as necessary and as real of a human being that actually has compassion mm -hmm. and knows how to have a conversation with someone, how to listen, how to hear what their challenges mm -hmm. are, how to solve conflict in a better way. And so all of those skills that we want for world leaders, that we want for teachers, that we want, business is suffering badly without that. And a lot of businesses that do better are the ones that do have that. One of the things that you were involved in that I read about was you, you thought it was important for the people who are going to be leading in technology. I'd like to talk a bit about technology because I think it's a great source of stress in the workplace and people don't know how to handle it. But you brought together a group of young leaders or leaders in technology to have this kind of conversation with them. Tell, tell us about that. Well, well, first, one of the things that's happening is uh, very young success. We're, we're having people that are really barely formed as mature adults getting a billion dollars. Where do they get skills about what we're talking about? So one of the things with, with Hollyhock, one of my intersections with Hollyhock in addition to being board chair and having recruited a woman to be the CEO who is my 18-year wife now. Um, <laughs> you is, met her there? Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> is that we bring together unique conferences. And those are more like crafted gatherings. And they are designed with this underlying premise that our real work is to help everyone be a better human being. Hmm. But we talk about business or we talk about whatever the subject area is. And we've worked with young people in technology companies who are under particularly unique new kinds of stresses and pressures that haven't been studied for a long time and, and don't have their culture developed that well. So in those groups, when we start each morning and say that the first half of this morning is about personal ecology, and we're going to break you into small groups, and we're going to ask questions like our opening person did today, but we go fairly deep with that over several days, that no, 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 or we sing together, or we <laughs> do things that bring out the human being. And so by, by set and setting and the right environment and by modeling that, it encourages and asking people's patients to just try it, uh, we find extraordinary results. Do you? You start to see people come around to that, to, to what? They come around to more, they start to take on practices. They look at what's unhappy in their lives, how their relationships are going, how their employer relationships are going, all, all of that, how, how to relate to customers better, how to deal with the fact they're on a screen all day long mm -hmm. and their families are alienated from them and, and things like this. And so they begin to get clues that there are other ways. And sometimes we've brought a professional psychologist to the room, not to do therapy, but to talk with each person one-on-one uh, -on -one as, as desired, uh, to say, here are practices, people, types of professions that are available to you, just to simply educate them that there's other ways. Mm -hmm. And by modeling it from the people that are on stage and giving these experiences and then providing resources, I think that formula works. Mm -hmm. And so those people become comfortable with being vulnerable. So if they're a leader, they're, they can be also vulnerable. They don't have to always have the answer. And it changes the way we do business. And it? many of them walk in yeah. the room who've never done that before yeah. voluntarily. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what's interesting, Maria, uh, when Joel's talking about modeling, is I think we have a little bit of an advantage in the school system in that we have for a few years been realizing what makes children more well in the classroom. So we, we have that knowledge of when we welcome them, when we um, create a classroom culture where people feel like they belong, um, where the, it's okay, we let them know you can ask questions and, and no question is the wrong question and you can uh, try something new and it's okay if it doesn't work, right? Like we, we're, we're teaching with those, children. With children, we're doing those wonderful things in the classroom and there's our model. There's our model for the workplace. But we have, what we haven't done yet and what we're just starting to do, and this is the exciting part, is taking that same model and thinking about it with the adults, right? What makes them feel safe to ask questions? What makes them feel like they're an important part of our community. So when you started like doing that in, in Langley, what kind of response do you get from people when you say, come one, come all, we're going to start focusing on our own well-being? Well, a few different responses, but the biggest one is, oh, thank goodness. Um, and 
it's not like people haven't been doing it before. Like there's wonderful people, and I'm probably looking out at them right now, but I can't see them because the lights are shining at me, um, that have been doing wonderful things already. And they're just so happy that we're starting to talk about it. Um, so that part's good. But yeah, just a bit of a, a relief, I guess, that people are starting to actually think about it. Um, and so what is a strategy? What is the strategy? Well, well, because there are school districts here who are all just now beginning to think about what kind of a, now, now we get down to really practical suggestions. Uh, what, how do you begin to uh, do for adults in the room what has been done with and for children? Well, we have a bunch of ideas. <laughs> We're <laughs> gathering more. Um, we've talked to other people who are doing similar things in other districts, um, so gathering that information. Um, we are trying to find out from our people, from the, from the adults in our system, how they're doing. So that's sort of at the beginning phases. We want to ask them, how is it going for you? What is your experience? So we want to get that data. And then we want to put it together with the research that tells us what makes people well at work. And then get everyone involved in trying to look at how we can use those two pieces of information, put them together, and uh, come up with ideas to look at strategies mm -hmm. and policies and relationships and all of those things. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's sort of the plan, and I know that it'll evolve and change as we go, and the other districts that are doing similar things will help inform that practice, and then we'll do the same for mm -hmm. them. And so I don't know exactly what it'll look like, but that's kind so of So I'm the... curious about you two are nodding your head. Here is a, here is a shifting culture essentially, and that's not an easy thing to do. But I know that there are a lot of people in, in this room who are, are on that journey. So I'm, I'm wondering why you're nodding your heads. What are you hearing that you, that you support? What would you add to that? Mm. Well, immediately when I was listening to her, I was thinking about how business is using a lot of concepts from the education system. Oh, really? So Carol Dweck's research, mm -hmm. um, open versus a growth mindset versus a closed mindset, and how that this is just a growth mindset that she's exemplifying. Um, what I find fascinating um, is that, so for, for businesses, people think that you should focus on the, the financial metrics. Well, what's been shown is the worst performing organizations are those that just focus on the financial metrics. Those that focus on culture, which is what you're talking about, and finance, with a two-thirds emphasis on culture and one-third on finance, are the alchemical hmm. uh, uh, amazingness. But the thing is, and the challenge is, and the invitation is, to measure culture. So she might be measuring culture right now. And if so, or might not, but then the invitation would be to try to, be, to begin to measure culture, because what gets measured gets managed. And when you say measure culture, you mean ask questions of people, uh, what's happening for you within this context? And, and getting really specific. So for some cultures, it might be, what is our turnover? What is our employee engagement? What is our absentee days? Does everybody in our organization have a strong relationship? But getting very, it has to be individually considered by the organization, but getting very, very, very clear cultural metrics, as clear as we are for financial metrics. Mm -hmm. So we're bringing back, the, culture's mercurial, and we need to, for us to focus on it, we need to, to put our numbers there. Well, my first nodding is because I agree so much with the strategy. Um, when you consider the psychic load of today, not this room, but the larger today, what's going on in the world, and the pressure that we all are walking around with, uh, maintaining optimism and a positive culture is possibly getting harder. The tools are more valuable. Um, I, 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 don't, I would like to hear the science on, on you, we're carrying so much more every year, and Right now, there are lots of good reasons to be quite concerned about the future mm -hmm. of civilization, mm -hmm. really. And that is a lot to walk around with. We manage. But every single workplace or organization, even in a privileged culture, as much as Canada and North America, um, 
there's a lot of inner suffering going on. And, not, and having outlets to be able to express that and share about it is really gold. And I, I, I think that's where hopefully a lot of the best of what global religions offer is sense of community and a place to share. Um, I have faith in that. Mm -hmm. um, they do their best, I hope. Um, but that, I think, we, we need a spiritual evolution at this point in time to deal with what the world is actually like now and what's demanded of us as human beings. Mm -hmm. And that spiritual evolution in, in my lexicon is what's needed in order to redirect the trillions of dollars mm -hmm. floating around this planet mm -hmm. unconsciously mm -hmm. or intentionally doing things that most of us in this room would not be proud of. And that's in our pension funds, our banks, our workplaces. Mm -hmm. And so the combination of that at the bigger scale is uh, probably, for, for me, is the uh, future key to the survival of a happy, positive civilization mm -hmm. in the future. Yeah, so as I'm hearing you talk, that my part of my brain, that's the, the part of the brain that you know grew up in this culture, says, oh yeah, that's all very well, talk about spirituality, but we got to work, we got to make money. But I think what I'm hearing, and we've got you know productivity, we've got to build our whatever, but I think what I'm hearing here, and I think this is what you're saying, is that if we do not focus on the kinds of things that we're talking about in this room, that we aren't going to be as productive, that we aren't, that's in fact, it's these things we're talking about here that are going to make these companies or these schools, these organizations more productive. That's Did I say it? You, you got it, Maria. <laughs> you got it. You got it. Are you starting to see any changes or difference in the school district just with even a year-long um, focus on well-being? People coming around? I do, because um, people are starting to talk about it. And like I said, there were things probably going on. I know they were, you know, some wonderful things happening. But people are having conversations. And, um, you know, it is going to take some time. But actually beginning to talk about it is the mm -hmm. really important thing. It's going to take patience. It's going to take courage. It really is. Because wow. as much as you are going to be talking about all these wonderful things and we're going to be sharing them, there's going to be discussions that are difficult to have too, that, that ask difficult questions and ask uh, people to look at things that are long-term traditional structural systems. Um, so it will take some courage, um, but it's starting. So, and we hear back from people who are trying things out in their classrooms or with their peers or in their workspaces and coming back and saying, hey, you know, we, we, we did this and this is what happened. This is how people felt. And yeah, so it, it is starting, even the fact we're having the conversation about the adults. Yeah. It's just so huge mm -hmm. that we're thinking about that. Yeah, so, so this is, these are questions about, a few questions about that conversation we had about leaders and uh, how do you, it's actually a very good question because if you're not a leader, but you work under a leader, <laughs> you work for a leader who isn't all of those wonderful things, is there anything you can do to, um, uh, to shift that, to help the leader become more of that awakened or self-aware person? <laughs> well, I, I can answer it from my perspective, and then I'm sure you guys, um, I, I think that you become a leader. Um, and in whatever capacity you are able to, because you, if you want to work with someone who is a leader and they, and you do that and hopefully they work along with you, um, but if they don't, um, you become a leader to whatever capacity you can what in whatever mean? way. So you talk to people, you have the conversations, you be brave enough to say what's going on here or um, let's try this, or and you find a group of like-minded people that are going to engage in that conversation with you. So everybody's a big uh, set to talk about. Some of us don't have so much choice about where we work and how we simply survive. So that's one category we would address separately. For those of us that have some mobility or sense that we do have choices, the first obvious is 
vote with your feet and really study the kinds of companies and people you're going to work with or organizations and make choices about that. Okay, that's an obvious point. Then I think if you have enough of that security, then yes, we are all leaders. You can be, you can be a leader within a zone that is not going to uh, throw fire, you know, throw matches onto the fire kind of thing. Um, and so we all need to do what we can. We need to go back home and do it. We need to do it with our friends. And it is a muscle that can be practiced and learned. There are things to read. There are courses to take. But I, I really believe that uh, if one is able to be astute enough to assess a situation and find the places where you can be a leader within whatever part of an organization you're in, that that's tremendously valuable and makes a much better organization. Uh, I wholeheartedly agree uh, with, with what they've said. Uh, and I, I'll talk about my own experience. Uh, sometimes when I walk into boardrooms, it's all men, and the body language is this. <laughs> There's, and I'm like, okay. And over the years, what I've come to learn is that by first discussing research and by first engaging the mind, the head, it allows something in the leader's nervous system to drop and the body language changes. Now, if there's not openness, it is very, very, very hard. And I like this, become the leader. Own that yourself. At f first, though, you know, just engage their mind with some data. Mm -hmm. Would be an invitation I would have. Maybe as a male, I can get away more <laughs> with the opposite strategy, which is to do something to throw them off. <laughs> <laughs> what have you done? I focus on myself in some way that um, is vulnerable. Uh, I can hear there's some recognition. Lead with that. vulnerability is, is mm -hmm. a rule that uh, I've uh, taken on. <laughs> and what do you see happen? It disarms, and it uh, causes empathy, mm -hmm. or it puts them into a different mm -hmm. mindset. Yeah. Well, we're, we've, unfortunately, the questions arrived late, so I'm not going to be able to get to all of them. But I do have, um, just give each of you one last, uh, one last word of wisdom to leave. Because just imagine that everybody who's here is either working uh, for an organization, leading an organization, working with an organization. Just one thing for them to think about when they go back to work. What's today? Is today Friday. a weekend? Friday, Friday thank Friday. you. Uh, Monday, unless they're working tomorrow, what's one thing to keep in mind if they want to be that champion of well-being? Uh, the whole uh, awake asleep line. Are we coming from that awake place physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and being and creating that field around us. So asking yourself, being aware about your own. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. First with the context of choosing where this is safe enough to do. There are many reasons to be wise about that. The world is in a critical moment and all of us here are the ancestors of what's coming. And we care. I think I'm in a room of people who really do care and as much as we can be thinking long term and giving up as much of ourself as we can to be about that, about post our life, about 500 years from now, about uh, next generations, that that generational responsibility, that ancestral responsibility must be top of mind now for as many of us as possible because humans in our great ingenuity have created fantastic wonders and tools and opportunities and we've left out a lot of the whole picture. And it's, we are the ones living on the planet with the most capacity ever before in history to do damage and to do good. And this is the time. Yeah. 
Yeah, and you know what? I'm going to add to that because part of my shoulders start to go up because I feel like it's so much responsibility and then I remind myself what we're talking about today is what you're talking about. How can we do what you're talking about if we're unwell, if we're not doing well? So sure. I hope you don't mind that I added that because that, 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 I think that fits beautifully. Thank you. I guess I would leave people with just the thought to um, look at the decisions that you make and the choices that you make through that wellness lens. So, um, yeah, I think I would leave it at that. Just think about whether this is going to make people, yourself and others, more well. Yeah. Yeah. And I do want to say, because, uh, Gil, you're going to walk off the stage and say, oh, I forgot to say this, but there are people along your way who really helped who were in the room today. So Greg Smith is here from Port Alberni, and his team welcomed you, and I came with you months ago to watch what they're doing, to try to build on that. The Ma Maple Ridge team, who are also here today, welcomed you. Um, and so I think that's worth mentioning, because there are more, if, if there's one school system that wants, wants to do this, there's another. If there's one business that wants to do it, there's to find each other find mm -hmm. each other. So Maria, can I just yes. add one thing? Do it. Okay. Because I just, yesterday I heard that there needs to be a hardening of the school system. And oh. I just want to say actually a softening yeah. is what is required. So I'd urge us all to soften our, <laughs> soften our hearts. I just had to bring it up because it relates well, to Well, gee, thanks. Uh, sorry, Maria. <laughs> but to, I agree. to be softer. It's an yeah, invitation yeah. to be the softer. The timing for this conversation yeah. is perfect. Yeah. Well, thank you. And please join me in thanking our panel. Yeah.